the three laws of armored combat. Were they written into law? No, they were not. They are probably more like principles. Are they rules? No, they're not rules. I learned them as the three laws, so I'll continue to call them laws. Tanks don't go where the cattails grow. Tanks don't fly. Steel is harder than flesh. Combat vehicles have the right of way. I started in the Army as a track vehicle mechanic, and after being commissioned, my first platoon was a tank platoon. And my first platoon sergeant, shown here on the screen, was Sergeant First Class Steve Johnson, who taught me the three laws. As I became a tanker and learned to love the Abrams, I added the fourth law. These laws are truths. Over the years, decades, probably not centuries, but over decades, tankers, scouts, artillerymen, and other armored force soldiers have attempted to disprove these laws. I say attempted, and I mean they have unsuccessfully attempted to disprove these laws. They are laws and cannot be disproven. So let's talk about them. Tanks don't go where the cattails grow. The first law probably isn't intuitive to most tankers, or at least most tankers are fairly hard-headed and either have a poor grasp of physics or they do have some understanding of it, but it's very limited. We all know that track vehicles are made to go in slow-go and no-go terrain or in poor terrain where other vehicles cannot go. They can go places where most wheeled vehicles could never go. Here's a M113 APC easily pulling a Humvee out of the mud. Because of the large surface area of the tracks, track vehicles have a very large ground contact area which gives them traction and flotation. Not water flotation, but earth and mud flotation. But like everything, they're only designed for certain terrain and they're not designed for swamps or areas where the cattails grow. They will become mired. Tanks don't fly. Yeah, I'm not talking about air transporting tanks. Sure, tanks will fly on a C-17 or a C-5 Galaxy, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about the old days when we had the Sheridan and we we're uh, air dropping them out of a C-130. Or, or even modern tanks, that future tanks, that uh, future combat systems that were supposed to be transported on a C-130. Or as my buddy that was a defense contractor suggested, we ought to just slingshot them or put them on balloons or something, right? Um, you know, I'm talking about tanks flying under their own power, and I'm not talking about a hover tank. Or something like that that uh, Bill Murray or Dan Aykroyd might have uh, played with. You know, I'm talking about tanks and tanks don't fly. So you know these Soviet tanks that are supposedly firing you know while they're in the air you know you can see by the way the gun tube is elevated they're not shooting at anything. They're just firing the cannon. This tank however happens to be an Abrams tank and this tank can shoot on the move and it doesn't matter if the tank is hovering above the ground like this one happens to be or flying off a small berm this tank has a stabilized turret, a stabilized gun system that can shoot on the move so it really doesn't matter to the weapon system whether it's in the air or not but when you do that to a tank an Abrams or any track vehicle in the modern army it's definitely hard on the suspension system, it's hard on the electronic components, and it's definitely hard on the crew once you come down out of the air. You know, I've uh, been in the air on both an Abrams and an M3 A2 Bradley, and I can tell you the, the Bradley was a softer landing just by the, the path that we took over the small berm, but... Uh, an Abrams coming out of a ditch uh, it was not a pleasant 
landing on the Abrams. And sure, there's plenty of things for your face to hit when you're in the commander's hatch. You know, the, the gunner might be up against his brow pad and the driver might be laid back, but the loader, he's either standing up or attempting to sit down. His life is not happy when you come down off the air and the TC in his hatch, you know, he's got nothing to uh, hold him back but his, his two paws that he's got in front of him and uh, you can easily bump your face into a number of things including 50 cal mounts, that copula ring, or the freaking sight that's in front of them, the gunner's sight extension that's in front of them. It just isn't a happy situation. So tanks don't fly. Steel is harder than flesh. Now, do I need, really need to elaborate on this one? You know, tankers are continually trying to prove that steel is not harder than flesh. You know, it's like when a new tanker is always bumping their head on something. You know, you have a CVC helmet. This is, offers the best protection for any body component inside the tank is a combat vehicle crewman helmet. It's padded. It's, it's either got a, a Cavalar shell or it's got a fiberglass shell. This one happens to have a Cavalar shell on it. To offer some ballistic protection but even with the the other shell it offers a lot of protection from bumps and bangs it's uh, really fairly good of course it doesn't have any kind of a face shield so like I was just saying about flying the tank you can still bump your face into stuff now your your elbows your forearms your knee shins your knees all suffer when you're inside a tank there's there's no soft edges inside a tank or on the outside of a tank you're always bumping into them. You know, there's a number of army safety messages to talk about tank crewmen and how tank crewmen are getting hurt on tanks or track vehicles. One especially is hatches. The hatches need to always be locked in the open or closed position. Crewmen are always getting hurt and or killed by hatches, but uh, steel is definitely harder than flesh and tankers I prove that over and over again. Combat vehicles have the right-of-way and from there it goes by tonnage or I'm talking about vehicle weight. After being a tanker on Abrams, a scout on Bradley's and a track vehicle mechanic on the 88 and a number of M113's series vehicles. You know, this is intuitive to me. Have you ever seen a vehicle that got hit by a train? The train doesn't stop. And, you know, it's not easy to run over a Bradley with a tank like this uh, tank is running over the car in Operation Iraqi Freedom. This is a quite famous photo from Iraqi Freedom where a looter's car is getting run over. Probably not justified in uh, destroying his vehicle, but uh, a very famous photo nonetheless whether uh, what side of the controversy you stand on. Anyway, uh, the Abrams definitely has the right-of-way in any situation. And of course, from there it goes by vehicle weight. So that's the three laws. Tanks don't go where the cattails grow. Tanks don't fly. Steel is harder than flesh. Combat vehicles have the right-of-way. Now, that, this is concluding the video. I'm wrapping it up. Um, before I go, I want to tell you that uh, at Styles Automotive, I do general automotive work, modifications, and tips. I've also got an adventure series where I talk about my love of the great outdoors. And this is really some of the first videos in my military series. And I plan to do some other videos, maybe talking about uh, some of my knowledge of things like apricots and um, maybe do some... FMG guidance on what things I can teach you to uh, for a new soldier and um, Before I go this last little bit though. I think I'm going to talk about Steve Johnson some more So Steve is a tankers tanker. He may not look like much here in this uh, picture some of the fuzzy pictures, but Steve taught me as a new lieutenant to be a tanker 
And uh, it, we spent many hours in the Combat of Fire trainer where Steve taught my gunner and I how to shoot, how to uh, use the weapon system. And Steve may look like a he's a little goofy here, but he does have a, a serious side and he is an awesome tanker. He uh, does have a goofy sense of humor. And I'd like to tell you just a, a couple of stories about Steve, if I might. Um, Staff Sergeant Malcolm Kirby was having a tough time on the Table 8 range. He had uh, unsuccessfully navigated the, the day table on Tank Table 8, the night table, and then all day during the day table, and was getting ready to make his first run for the night shoot and Sergeant Kirby and his crew had not fired one round so something came up every time he attempted to go down range he could not shoot a bullet down range from what I remember and I was up in the tower Sergeant First Class Johnson was also up in the tower he told the tower operator the OIC of the tower to have Sergeant Kirby pull up to the base of the tower and stop. So uh, Sergeant Kirby was pulling his tank up to the base of the tower on the ready line down at Fort Stewart. Steve went down to the base of the tower and he, you know, used the methods he used was sometimes vulgar, sometimes maybe a little uh, profane, maybe a little uh, weird. But uh, the techniques he used were questionable when I first saw him. But uh, he bestowed some kind of a blessing on that crew. And once they doubt, went down range that night, they had a perfect night run. So um, I saw what he did. It was, uh, it was obscene. It was uh, probably rated more than rated R. It was probably rated X or maybe triple X. I don't know. Whatever you would, uh, how you'd classify what Steve did down there that night. But uh, the results were that uh, Sergeant Kirby and his crew had a perfect night run. So you can't question that when, you, when you're talking results, right? So another story about Steve. Years before I met him, thank God, years before I met him, um, Steve was one of the guys that was out in the field. He was a platoon sergeant. So he went uh, on these field exercises. He'd go without sleep for many nights. And of course, the first sergeant, first sergeant driver, and the commander's driver, they all got plenty of sleep. And um, when we're down at Fort Stewart, usually after an exercise, a lot of times my uh, company, Delta Company, went out to Savannah for um, an evening meal. We'd get some time off. Didn't get a lot of time off while we were down there. But years previous to when I got there, they did the same thing. And Steve went out with the, the two drivers and the first sergeant. And they went to an Irish pub down on the waterfront, down in Savannah. Had some potato soup or whatever, maybe a beer. Um, Steve was dog tired. Of course, he was not drunk. He might have had a beer. Steve was known to have a beer or two, but, you know, he had, he was an adult, he had to go back to work the next day, so he definitely was not drunk. But on the trip home, Steve fell asleep, and it was a sleep that was a sound sleep. He was in the back seat of the car, and um, his buddy that was back there happened to have a Sharpie pen and thought it would be hilarious to highlight Steve's mustache, so he blackened Steve's mustache. Of course, everybody in the car thought that was hilarious, so he drew glasses on Steve with a Sharpie pen that was a permanent pen and added other things. Of course, Steve was wearing a t-shirt and khaki shorts that night, and um, a penis was drawn on his leg that stuck out from his shorts, and then a number of other things. So, usually about this point in the story, when people are telling the story about Steve, They'll say, you'll hear somebody in the crowd will say, yeah, I remember that. I was there the next morning, and you could hear him scream. Well, 
The next morning, when Steve got up and went to the latrine and saw himself in the mirror, I guess he screamed that could be heard all over Fort Stewart. And the story goes on to say that uh, Steve then used a green pad and Ajax and attempted to get it off of everywhere that uh, he could scrub that would be seen outside the uniform. And uh, I guess he gave himself a pretty good red rash. He looked like he had a severe sunburn all over his face. And uh, he was not happy. But the story continues and has a happy ending. So in the end, Steve paid back those three individuals over time. And um, just to highlight one of the things, uh, the next field problem that Steve was with that first sergeant, every time he saw the first sergeant, he would put some of his chow underneath the first sergeant's Humvee seat. So it smelled like vomit in the first sergeant's Humvee, and the first sergeant couldn't figure out why. So uh, I don't know, if, if it was me, I would have had my driver investigate and clean that Humvee out. But uh, maybe as they cleaned it out, Steve would continue to uh, fortify his position and uh, add material to that smell heap. So uh, I think I'm going to stop with the story there. But uh, this is a, a tribute to Steve. Tonight I'm going to drink a beer for you, Sergeant Johnson. I appreciate what you did for me and getting me started on uh, my commissioned service as an armor officer and as a cav officer. I thank you.